to welcome everyone here to our Thriving Marriage podcast. We're super excited that you're here as we're sharing with you today text messages that will help to open up communication. I'm here with Mark Johnston. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing all right. It's good. good to be here. How are you doing today, Heather? Doing good. We survived our cold spell, as many of you guys did across the nation here in Colorado. Um, our energy bill was through the roof. I don't know if anyone else is getting hit with that too, but other than that, we're doing just fine. Um, excited to be here with you guys again. And before we go into Mark and I, you know, before we go into like the topic, we were just talking about how applicable texting is and knowing how to text. We're going to share some kind of do's and don'ts, maybe mm-hmm. some mistakes that people are making that could be preventing communication, shutting down communication from happening and the right way to go about it to be like a gateway, right? You're not going to really save your marriage with a text message alone, okay? But it is a good starting point to be able to open up more communication. But before we go into all of that, um, we're going to share a client win of the week. Mark, you want to run with that one? Yeah, I can... Certainly. Hold on. I, I've got it. If, if yeah, I need to go to the right tab there. I had <laughs> no, several no times up. And, yeah, if you All want right. to grab it. Sure. Yeah, this comes from our PATH course members, which we have a special announcement about that coming up really soon. But this PATH course member says, I just wanted to let you know that I went through and watched the program and tried the techniques. None of them worked on my husband. Or so I thought at the time but they did help me tremendously in understanding his side of the story since he could not express it. It helped me remain calm, become friends with him again and become a better parent. The strange part is that after I had given up hope and decided to move on three years later, on the day we were to go to the lawyer's office to sign the final divorce papers, there was a scheduling conflict. Our son needed a ride to a friend's house and I'd gotten email for the signing. So I had said I would give him a ride. When I found out, I said I could bring him later, that it shouldn't take too long. He said he might be able to get a ride, his dad said, or we could just forget the whole divorce thing. (laughs) So after talking it over and including how our son feels about it, we are working on our marriage. We stayed separated for a while, but now are back to living together. We are not quite there yet. A lot of damage was done. He cheated, but I have changed a lot and he is making changes like I've never seen before and things are moving in a good direction. So thank you very much. This changed the path of destruction I was going down and gave me breathing room to approach this from a rational perspective. And even though it did not appear that my husband was paying any attention, he obviously was and saw the changes I was making to myself. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. And so I got just a comment on that. I'm I'm seeing a lot of people that I'm working with currently and in the past and I think there's like a a really big desire to make things work right now to to move everything forward right now and to feel like everything is settled and taken care of right now um and I can understand that you know like these sort of scenarios are really painful it's hard to perhaps see your your partner pulling away and it's interesting stories like this, seeing how, you know, like so this this isn't always a a short term sort of issue. Actually, I would say a lot of times it's not just a, a simple short term issue. That you know, there's still a lot of room for things to get better in the long run, especially as you create that consistency. And I think this is a really good illustration of that. What about Absolutely. you? Some some thoughts there. Mark, uh, I don't know if you saw, we have a Slack channel for our company. Um, Another client had shared how four years ago, they joined the PATH course, the same course as this um, student and four years ago. And now she's so grateful that she did that because their marriage is saved. Very similar, uh, not exactly the same. There wasn't an affair in this situation that they divulged, but they were able to also turn things around and they have the kind of relationship that they always hoped to have, which was just really awesome to hear that. And hear her come back four years later to say thank you. So what is this PATH course? Well, this is our special announcement. We created this course several years ago, and we've continued to update it and improve it. But honestly, we've had it closed for about 12 months. We haven't offered it at all uh, because we've really focused on our one-on-one coaching. We still believe and know that it's the very best help that you can get for your marriage. 
is to get that really in-depth personal one-on-one -on -one coaching that's going to get you the fastest results. And so if you guys want that, again, just leave a comment, say coaching, and we'll give you a link to see if it's a good fit for you. But it is a financial investment to get one-on-one -on -one help at that kind of level. And not everyone has a lot of resources. And so we knew that we needed to be able to help even more people with their marriage and wanted to make it a lot more affordable. So we are actually going to be reopening this path course uh, for the first time in 12 months. And we're going to be giving a 90% uh, discount to the first 100 students. Now we haven't officially opened doors on this. So this is a little bit of a sneak peek preview, okay? And if you guys want to get in early and grab one of those 100 spots, just leave a comment, say path in the comments below, and we'll get you the link where you can join for 90% off. Again, after we get the 100 students, though, we will close doors on that. So this is the same program that this client, uh, this student just went through that had this turnaround, as well as the one that shared her story um, earlier. So it's super exciting. And I really hope that if coaching is not a good fit for you, um, first of all, try to do the coaching because that's going to be the very best bet for you. But if you can't do that with financial constraints, then make sure you get in on this program because um, I don't know we're going to be able to offer it again. So that's our exciting announcement. And now let's dive into texting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know in the comments here, what text has your spouse sent you recently? And Mark, if we could watch comments in the group, I will keep my eye on it too. And we'll be looking for your answers live. But even if it's, you're not listening live, make sure you put your answers there because we can give you specific help for those text messages. So put a comment in the group and let us know what kind of text has your spouse sent you recently. Uh, as they're going ahead and filling that in, Mark, what are some of the common ones that you see from our clients? What are some kind of common texts that they get from their spouse? We had like a couple well, common themes, maybe. Well, largely, you know, I actually have been talking a lot with my clients about text messages this last couple of weeks. Um, it really kind of depends on where people are at in the process, but especially early on, uh, I tend to see a lot of communication, a lot of messages that are specifically trying to uh, establish some boundaries within the relationship. And generally speaking, like we're, you know, when someone is starting to consider divorce, they're needing to try and protect that goal. And so that's like a lot of like, where we get a lot of pushback, where we get a lot of tension and arguments is especially around those sort of things. Um, and, you know, I talking with a lot of my, my clients, it, it can be very, very frustrating as you're saying like, Hey, I, I want to fix this. I want to make things better. And you get someone who is like shutting down, um, putting up walls and, or, um, having a lot of arguments you know, around any sort of positive behavior that you might be attempting. But I would say that's a large part of like what I see from those partners who are pulling away. What What are your thoughts on that? Like, why do you think, Heather, like why, why would that be the case at all in in these sort of situations? Like, why would there be arguments? Why would there be walls? Why would there be um, that stonewalling behavior, especially at these early stages? Right. So that's indicative of the symptoms, right? These are all symptoms. Um, it can spill out in your text messages. It can spill in your in-person conversations and in the behavior that you're seeing from your spouse. They mm -hmm. may seem like they're even on a path of self-destruction and relationship destruction. Um, and what we have uncovered here with working with, you know, several tens of thousands of students and clients now is that it's, it's due to your spouse having a story or a narrative about you and the relationship. And the more that you try to push them to change or come back to you or to stop thinking the way that they're thinking, the more they seem to persist in doing it. <laughs> and so that's why turning a marriage around is a very specific process and needs to be handled with care. You typically can't save your marriage the same way you lost it. So some people will try, um, you know, just to you know, take everything that their spouse says is wrong and just try to do the opposite, right? Try to do all the right things. And even that tends to backfire uh, because either they don't believe those changes that they're seeing in you or um, they believe them, but they don't care anymore, all right? So it all kind of comes back to there is a reason why they want out. There is a reason why they're doing what they're doing. There's a reason why their texts 
might be argumentative or blaming, judgmental, stonewalling, shutting down, dismissive, right? Any of those behaviors hmm. that we're seeing. I'm thinking of like a, an example. Uh, I was just talking with someone earlier in the day today. And he, he was coming to me and he was saying, hey, like, this is getting really frustrating. This is, you know, as as much as I try to, like, try to talk to her about wanting to hear her out and help her to feel appreciated, she just won't respond and she doesn't want this. This is what he was, he was arguing. And it was really interesting because, like, a lot of these were taking place over text messages, the, these sort of conversations. And... I had to give him some some hard feedback as in like, hey, you feel <laughs> you're what you're doing here is you're saying uh, here, here are all these complaints that she's had. And then you're trying to, like, come in and fix this. And a lot of the, the complaints that she had, she said, I don't feel heard. I don't feel like you're listening to me. I don't I feel like I'm invisible. Like I you don't hear my my like you don't listen to my choices here. And I was just pointing out, like, hey, in all of this, have you actually sat and taken a look at how she's feeling and have have some acceptance of that? And he's like, and he argued with me. He's like, no, I've I I listened to her and I gave her everything that she wanted, and you know, like I took care of her, and that's what all I'm trying to do right now. And I I had to tell him, like, look, you're not doing that. <laughs> and it was a really odd sort of conversation, you know, from his perspective. He tried to he tried to take care of his wife and he tried he was continuing to try and take care of his wife and he was trying to listen to her. Meanwhile, she's saying, I didn't feel seen. And these are like these are actually really can be these damaging texts, as odd as that sounds, when it's gotten to this point. You know, I'm thinking of like um what specifically is like creates uh some distance in text messages and i i think this is really important to kind of acknowledge here i, I want to get your opinion on this heather like what what do you think really turns people away from communication and actually having good text messages when things are falling apart what do you think causes that yeah well, the first caveat that I want to say is that texting is not our ideal form of communication, <laughs> okay? Oh, but we know that you're going to do it. And so, for some of you, it's like the only, you may be so limited in your interactions now that texting might be about all you get. And so with that being the situation, you really want to make sure that you're doing it the right way. The problem with texting, as we should all know, but we just have a culture of it's easy, it's convenient, I can say whatever else on my mind right now or whatever it might be, or you can take time to kind of craft the way you want to say it. Like we've seen all different kinds of, you know, habits or behaviors around texting. But um, the bottom line is, is that it's so easy to misunderstand what someone means. It's so easy to assume ill intent and just the platform itself. Written word is never as easily understood as face-to-face -face communication, where you can hear the voice inflection, you can see the body language, you can tell more their intent and you can have a more effective interaction. So knowing that <laughs> there are times when we probably don't want to text certain things, right? And we mm -hmm. can go into that in a little bit, but some of the behaviors that might be shutting down uh, even the texting communication and preventing more in-person communication is definitely any of those behaviors of being defensive, blaming, stonewalling, you know, shutting down yourself, being disrespectful, being dismissive of their feelings, these are all the things that will inhibit communication face-to-face -face and in a text message. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy when your partner says, uh, it's all your fault, blah, 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 for you to go back and say, well, look at what you did, da, 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 you know, and then we had the ping pong match of back and forth blame game, right? Or it's easy to shut down yourself or to push too hard too soon. All of these different things can definitely create more tension. Uh, yeah, I think like what you just commented there is I think a lot of people in trying to say use text messages to try and repair the, the situation, you, you mentioned like there's a little bit of a too much of pushing too soon. And 
I think this especially comes about like as there are sometimes demands to to try and work things out. Things like you might be texting like, hey, why won't you answer me? Or, hey, we, we need to work on this for the children's sake. Or, hey, where were you last night? All, any sort of like barrage of questions like this might seem reasonable. You know, these are perhaps reasonable questions, especially in a healthy relationship, one that can withstand a little bit of pressure. But a lot of times this too much and too soon really pushes people away and it results in the other thing that you mentioned there's some of this stonewalling and backing away uh, i think what a lot of people especially like the, the clients that we work with have had to come to realize at some point is the relationship is not the same anymore if your partner is considering leaving it it doesn't work to make those assumptions and to make those kind of demands, you know, it makes sense when you're all working together and you say, hey, I want, we both want the relationship to work. You can make some demands for the sake of the relationship. Mm -hmm. But when they're considering leaving, it, a lot of that goes out the window. And what it comes across as is like a lot of these demanding text messages, you need to answer me. We need to work on this. Why can't you do this, you know, for the kid's sake or whatever it happens to be? It, it tends to be seen as very, self-centered it's about you and how you feel and what you need and what you need from them it puts a lot of pressure on the situation and it's really centered a lot on insecurity and fear that may be justified but it is not easy to deal with right. so I, I do think that like this is a really big mistake that a lot of people make is like especially when it gets shut down just to text communication where they they're like okay well the only option i have is texting so i'm going to put all my all, all this effort, all this pushing right there. And it just ends up backfiring, I think. Yeah. I can see some of your comments as you guys are watching live that, you know, texting is the only way that you really have to communicate um, and that your spouse is avoiding communication. So you're not alone. I'd love, again, for any specific text that you've had from your spouse, go ahead and put those in the comments and we can do a little bit of a workshop here. We can workshop with you on how to respond. Um, Mark can give you guidance on how we would coach you if you were a client on how to respond to that text um, to your spouse so that it actually helps to open up things. So I'd love to see some of those comments happening over there. Mark, is there ever some topics that you just absolutely should not text about or some situations when texting would not be a good idea? That's a, that's a good question. I think a lot of it is a bit circumstantial um, but, you know, I do think that in terms of like what we should not be texting about, um, I, I get a lot of clients who have made mistakes of really opening up with criticism over text messages. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a, you know, even if that's your only mode of communication, I think it's a really poor mistake to to be going that route. Like things like, hey, you uh, you never listen to me or you're never there for the children or why how could you have a, abandoned the children like that you know like these sort of things even though you're talking maybe about the kids um it, it just is not going to go well you know there's so much room for interpreting things negatively here and it's just going to push them further away uh now i i you know, if there's room f to talk about those th sort of things, I think it's it's better to invite your partner to address some of these topics calmly over the phone, if possible, or in person would be better. But it's never really a, a good um, vehicle for communication, you know, like addressing these issues over text. It's just it's a big mistake. Yeah, I would agree. I think kind of the theme here is goes right along with our path process, right? Is that um, if you're heading straight off the cliff towards divorce, uh, you're on that train track, the tra this train's just steamrolling towards the cliff, you've got to stop the train first. So we've got to put the brakes on the things that are adding more fuel to that fire, meaning we've got to stop doing the negative things that are pushing them even further away. So we need to stop pushing, like the demanding, like Mark was talking about, any of the criticism, the blaming, the stonewalling, the silent treatment, any of that kind of behavior that you're doing yourself, we've got to immediately stop that. Uh, we also call this like reducing the tension. 
if there's so much tension, it's just come, come to the boiling point where everything just turns into, you know, way too much tension. Uh, even if it's the cold, icy tension, like that has its own tension, right? We've got like the volatile, angry, arguing, fighting kind of tension. And then we've got like the stony, cold tension, right? Full of fear and insecurity uh, and all of those things. So um, we want to reduce that tension. And then after we've reduced some of that tension, we want to start to set things up properly and we want to be effective in our communication. One of the first things to do that is to gain perspective into what your spouse is going through. And Mark, I remember, I don't know if you remember this conversation, but I remember one of uh, clients had texted you something like, I told you it's over. You should just move on. And we loved the way you coached it so much that I took it for some of our marketing. <laughs> so I really remember this. I shared it in like several different master classes because uh, he was like, how do I respond? You know, mm -hmm. she keeps shutting me down completely. Like I have, like I have no ground to work on. And so this is be an opportunity we see this as an opportunity every time, right? And so every text that you get from your spouse is actually an opportunity to do things in a different way, to reduce some of that tension and just start to open the door towards setting things up to go right. Uh, I remember you said something along the lines of this, and, and maybe you would coach it differently now. If so, let us know. But you mm -hmm. said something like, I understand that for you, it is over. I'm just having a hard time like coming to grips with that. I would like to understand you and what you're going through. I would love to see if you'd be willing to have like a, a single conversation with me about that. Um, not any pressure to make things work or anything. I'm just really wanting to understand you. Is that something you'd agree with? And that was kind of how you had coached that client in that circumstance. Any thoughts on that when they're getting like the total shutdown of, I told you it's over, you should just move on. Um, I even saw in a couple of DMs, someone had sent me some text messages that their spouse said, and it was a very similar thing. Like we're going to get a divorce is what she was saying. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do. Like, stop trying. How would you uh, coach someone on how to respond to that? Well, so that it's a, it's a good question. And the example is good, but I actually want to explain why. And it might not apply to all, all circumstances. So when I hear something like that statement, like, hey, this is over, you just need to move on, things like that. You know, this is coming from a place where that that partner is really feeling the need to set those boundaries and protect the, I'm going to put it in quotes, the solution that they're pursuing. So a lot of times when people are pulling away, they say, okay, if I separate, if I divorce, things will be better. And now as you're trying to talk to me, you're trying to pull me away from this solution that uh, is going to make me happier in some way. And so they're going to be a bit prickly. They're going to set some harsh boundaries. They're going to be sharp around that. Um, I really like, you know, there's a lot of concepts around how do we reduce resistance. Just These are like concepts that it, it's more of like a kind of like a pro professional theories in terms of like how to deal with resistant clients. But I, I think a lot of these really apply um, to resistant spouses as well. And like in, in one of the principles that comes to mind is like this idea of just kind of rolling with the resistance. And I think this is, it's important here because the resistance is there because they feel like you're opposing them. And if you you meet this and that resistance, um, and you're like, you know what? No, I, I, I get it. Like, I, I can see why you're really upset. And that, you know, I'm fine, you know, with that it's, makes sense that you're upset um and you and you just kind of move on from there like it, it it doesn't you're not really opposing their the resistance so much it's it's one piece of the puzzle you know if i were to like craft uh just a general response to something like that and be like hey you know like this is this i can see that you're really upset around this things must be really difficult you know a large part of like why i'm trying to talk to you is i'm i'm trying to build up at least a decent relationship for for co-parenting and i want to make sure that you know no matter what we can have some amount of communication and i understand that you're concerned that i'm trying to pull back in if that feels like if you feel like i'm crossing some lines i actually want you to to let me know because i'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable here but i am trying to do some some good with what we have and i'll, I'll i want to break that down 
Mm -hmm. Much like I mentioned, you know, there's a principle there of like rolling with the resistance. I'm not fighting against the resistance. I'm, a, I'm also emphasizing a lot of collaboration with a statement like that, rather than trying to confront them or trying to tell them how they're doing things wrong, that how they shouldn't be shutting down. I'm, I'm joining in on some of their goals. And even there, like, this sounds really counterintuitive, but even on joining in on the goals, uh, their, their values around setting these boundaries makes it so they don't need those boundaries as much as that. I'm saying, hey, I can see that you're feeling really uncomfortable, that you feel like I'm trying to draw you back in, that I'm trying to like make you stop the divorce. And if you're feeling that way, I want you to let me know. Like joining in there reduces the need for them to put up those walls themselves and fight against you. But what I'm getting at here is like I, I could like I could list off a bunch of statements for like bits of resistance like this, and we could um really break that down but what like the the basic thing here is there are principles that help guide a lot of these really difficult conversations and you know i, I don't know i i felt like <laughs> i felt like that it was a clever response what i just gave here but all i'm really doing is i'm i'm uh referencing a lot of these these very principles that help people feel like you're working with them that you're not yeah. fighting against them. It's all meant to reduce resistance and gain some amount of cooperation, which is what I'm assuming you're all wanting from these text messages. Right. It has to be the first step is reduce some of that resistance, that tension, so that then they can start to feel safe and wanting to take steps towards you, wanting to have more conversations with you, feeling like it's safe to talk about things. What mm -hmm. I noticed, some of those principles, if I could just pull them out, uh, I, I noticed... Uh, definitely a pattern interrupt. If you're in a pattern of negative communication, which I saw several people in the comments admitting I've been super negative <laughs> in all my texting, or I definitely have seen that I've done that, or I slip into that, I get triggered by that. Um, and so you're interrupting that pattern. You're not stepping back into those things that are fueling the fire, right? You took the pressure off. I don't know if you guys could sense that, but did you sense that he, like the pressure was off? his spouse in this. I can give you a very specific, um, it, this is all actually from a, a very specific theoretical backing. It's, uh, the theory is called motivational interviewing. <laughs> it was, it's actually meant for uh, dealing with, I, I think it was originally developed for dealing with like uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, people who were, would be coming into an office and feeling like, they don't need to actually make changes. They're like forced to be there for therapy. And the whole concept was uh, was around like, how do you deal with these people? How do you get them to actually slow down, um, feel like that you're not working against them and actually reflect on their own behavior? And if, if those are the goals, can you imagine how they're like, isn't this what like most people who are working with us, isn't that what they want? They want their spouse to slow down. Mm -hmm feel like you're not working against them and, you know, reflect on their own behavior a little bit as well. Exactly. And we often even make the analogy that sometimes your spouse is like addicted to the idea of divorce, mm -hmm. that they get so uh, wrapped up in this notion. They just tend to feed this story as like their only solution. And it's really hard for them to want to step away from that. So yeah, definitely applies. Yeah. So like basically what we're getting at here is, there are concepts of communication that most people don't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, most people don't have to deal with someone who's close to them really pulling away on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it makes sense that like most people don't know how to handle this. It's easier to say, well, here is my spouse. She's saying no. She's saying she just move on. Don't talk to me. I guess that's all I can do here and that's just it's not the case that's <laughs> not the case at all there's there's a lot of tools out there that can really help absolutely and thank you guys for sharing some of your comments here on what kind of situations you were dealing with with your spouse i saw a lot of the same common themes um i don't get any response <laughs> i get minimal response um she has moved on i get the reminder that we're done I hope you find love again. I've heard these three times three. Oh, I got tongue tied. <laughs> I've heard this three times now. 
And so mm -hmm. if you guys have a specific text message that you want us to review and coach you on how to respond, then leave it in the comments and we'll follow up with you guys even after the podcast. So the bottom line is, it's just the tip of the iceberg, but if your texts aren't going right, it's very unlikely that your in-person conversations are going right. You guys agree? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so these are all things that add up to the bigger picture of where your relationship is at and where it's going to go. And the good news is that you can choose where that is and you can choose to educate yourself and gain some of these new skills to do things in a new way. I've said it so many times on the podcast, but I'm going to say it again. And when you do things in a new way, you're going to get new results. You really will. And it might take time and consistency, but if this person, your spouse is important to you and meaningful to you, then it's worth it, right? Do you guys agree that it's worth it to learn how to have new skills and to do things in a new way? Um, we've even seen that if it doesn't work in this relationship, those same skills that you're going to learn um, and interrupt some of the patterns that you might be in is going to serve you in all of your relationships. So to me, it's vital. I have to know how to learn. I have to learn how to communicate and apply those same principles to my children, to business, um, to friendships, extended family members, and my own marriage. And I'm very grateful that Mark has set that example and shared so much of his expertise and guided so many of you already on how to navigate this successfully. So again, remember, we have our special announcement of our PATH course is reopening for the first time in 12 months. And we go into all of these kind of issues like texting and communicating, um, affairs, how to restore trust, how to recover and restore relationship, even if your spouse is checked out, even if they won't talk to you right now, the whole gamut of situations. We really poured our heart and soul to give everyone that we could the very best chance to turn their marriage around. So it's 90% off to the first 100 students. I imagine it's going to fill up very, very quickly. Uh, we haven't officially opened doors yet, but if you want to get in early because you're a podcast listener, just leave a comment and say path and I'll get you a link where you can join to get in one of those hundred spots. So thank you so much, Mark, for sharing with us today. And our next episode, we're going to pull back the curtain on this path process even more and show you why you need path to save your marriage fast. But thanks for joining us today and we can't wait to see your marriage thrive. See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.